This is episode number 33 of the Expert Table Tennis Podcast. My name is Ben Larkham and joining me on the show today is Sean O'Neill. If you're in the US, I'm sure you're well aware of who Sean is. He was a US national team player back in the 80s and 90s. Sean made it to a world ranking inside the top 100. He lived in Sweden. Um, Then he transferred into the coaching side of things. He's become one of the most well-known and respected coaches in the US. Sean now coaches out of Portland. He works with a number of different players. He's worked with people such as Brian Pace and Tal Leibovitz, who've been on the show before. He was a coach to them. And now he does some one-to-one, some group coaching. He also works for USATT as their kind of webmaster and director of communications. And on top of all that, he also does the the commentary for a lot of table tennis events. He's going to be commentating on Rio um, for kind of the US TV channels. So I'm so happy to have Sean on the show. He's someone I wanted to get on for a while now. Let's get straight into the interview with Sean O'Neill. Joining me on the show today is Sean O'Neill. Hi, Sean. How, how are you doing, Ben? Yeah, doing very well. How are you? Excellent. Bit of a time delay. It's 8 p.m. over here. I believe it's, it's midday where you are. Yep, just around lunchtime. Yep, so you've still got the day ahead of you. I am coming to, to a close and pretty getting ready for bed after this. But it's great to have you on the show. I'd like to start off just by going through your story. I know that in the US, you're you're obviously really well known and, and players and coaches kind of will probably know all about who you are and, and how you came up into the sport and transitioned to coaching, etc. But I, I'm assuming that most of my listeners in the UK and, and from further afield maybe aren't so um, clued up. So if you could just give us a brief run through of yeah, of everything really from, from where you started, your playing career, and then going into your coaching. And, and yeah, it'd be great to hear your story. Okay, sure. So my first exposure to the sport was during the ping pong diplomacy tour that occurred in the United States in 1972. Um, my father was an active junior player in the cadet age division. Um, he was ranked nationally. And when the Chinese came to Cole Field House in Maryland, our whole family jumped in the car. We had to go and watch it. This was a really a national amazing thing occurring. I was only five at the time, but because we had a ping pong table in our basement, and of course, every son feels that their dad's the world champion and everything, I kept waiting for them to call him out of the audience to go and represent the U.S. against the Chinese. Oh. I thought that was like, okay, well, do you have your paddle? It's like you take your baseball mitt to a baseball game in case you catch a home run or a foul ball. And um, he's like, no, no, I'm not going to play today. But um, I was convinced that he was still one of the best in the country. So kind of fast forward from that one amazing event to us just finding the local club in Northern Virginia and making two weekly visits um, every week from 7 to 10 p.m. to play against the average probably 30 to 45-year-old. And I was, of course, only seven or eight at the time. Um, I had a blast. It was so much fun. I got to go to bed much later than all my classmates. And mm-hmm. the, the one lesson that was really apparent to me is I lost every match for the first year and every game. So I was kind of playing about five matches a week because you get on the table and you challenge up, then you lose. Sit down, put your name or your paddle on the table. You have to wait five or six matches. You get to do it again. But I really never got discouraged because, one, I realized I was playing older players, but I knew at some point I would start winning. And I've used that with a lot of the junior players that I coach that, you know, no one had it as tough as I did because very few people stay with something after losing so many matches in a row. Um, We had a local tournament In Virginia, we had two players from Thailand needing a place to stay. And our house, our family offered to let them stay at our place. Lo and behold, they were running summer camps in Minnesota. They talked my parents into letting me as a nine-year-old go for six weeks to Minnesota and to train with them six hours a day. And that was really the turning point in where I took it as a sport. A lot of physical training, Um, running a minimum. Right. So let's just... uh... So at nine years old, you you did six weeks of kind of intensive table tennis training. Hardcore multi-ball meditation, running at least three miles a day. Now, that's that's pretty rare, isn't it? I mean, especially in the US, I would assume. Well, what was what was kind of interesting is one of my biggest rivals, his name was Scott Butler. 
He was there for part of the camp. He wasn't there for all six weeks because he came with his father. But he also had a chance to see what, what was really at the time, it was the Japanese training model. Um, my coaches from Thailand had all trained in Japan. So a ton of squat jumps going up hills with people on your back, a lot of stretching, calisthenics, sprints. I mean, multi-ball, I thought was the coolest thing that was ever invented. I mean, to get to play on the table and hit like 300 balls in a row, often as hard as you could. Um, And then we had big tournaments when we were there. So I was just in heaven. And so Scott Butler, who was also at that camp, later on, we became the number one and two cadets, juniors, and we also played on a Pan Am team together. Um, to this day, we're still close friends. And his younger brother is pretty well known, Jimmy Butler, um, and he followed in Scott's footsteps. So very early, I got quality coaching. I learned the discipline of the sport, and I saw it played at an international level um, right before my eyes. So I think that that environment was really what propelled or kind of gave me a springboard to take it at a different perspective than a lot of other kids that might play at their local club, um, kind of joke around. I was already thinking training from the time I was 10 years old. Right. So, I mean, from from then on, were you playing other sports or were you really focused on table tennis? You know, they talk about specializing early or, or sampling lots of different sports. What was it like for you kind of growing up as a teenager and for th- through those years? It, it was really difficult because we had tournaments on the weekend. So because any sport that I might want to play, I loved basketball as a kid. Um, I went to basketball camp for a week with one of my best friends. I think I was in fifth or sixth grade. Um, and it was, again, I had a great time because there was a lot of running. Um, I played some tennis with my sister. I played it with a couple of my high school friends. But I could never figure out how I was going to fit in the, the necessary time to practice to be competitive like I was in table tennis. So in table tennis, I was literally playing, I would say two and a half, three hours a day during the week. And then there was tournaments on the weekend. And I was playing between 20 and 30 tournaments every year. So I really had a lot of tournament exposure. And then at the age of, I want to say 11, um, I was invited to play for a club in Stockholm called Angby Sport Club. And I became one of the American exchange players. So I would live there for six weeks in January. And then the boy who I stayed with, his name was Lars Matson. He would come to my house for the U.S. Open for six weeks. So I actually had a built-in practice partner in the summertime. And then in the wintertime, I got to go and play in, at the time, it would be like the Saphir International Tournament that was still going on at that point. Um, all the Stockholm team tournaments, league matches. Um, so then, boom, I mean, 10 years old and now I'm getting a chance to taste internationally where I ranked against the top Swedish boys who, as everyone knows, the generation right before me had Eric Lind, Jan-Ove Waldner, Jürgen Pearson, um, Ulf Carlson, Michael Applegren. Um, Peter Carlson was after me. But I mean, those were the players who would win the under 13s when I was battling the under 11s or in Ulf Carlson's and Applegren, they were like two years older than us. So they'd be playing in the 17s. So again, the environment was so critical for me to see what the next group of older kids were doing. So and then we had a U.S. group of kids, I want to say in around 1981 or 82, we went to China for two months. Um, Scott Butler, Jimmy Butler, Brandon Olson, and Kwa Win. And um, that was our taste, like I think Waldner has spoken about, to see what real table tennis is. I mean, we saw mm. how hard th- the worst player trained, meaning that they were never going to make a Chinese national team. They might be a Beijing B or C team, but they were so more advanced than we were that all of a sudden it put, again, into perspective of how hard you would have to work to do well, and then you almost felt bad for the Chinese players because in the U.S. we only had like three kids that played, and in China we're seeing kids that were at the rating level maybe like 2,500, and he would never have a chance to do anything outside of his club, which is a small section of a city. Um, so it really kind of made you appreciate the opportunities you would have as a U.S. player, um, in my case, that I wasn't going to face such stiff competition to be on our national team. It was more just keep doing the same thing and you'll get your opportunities. Yeah. The, the, the Swedish um, exchange program I did from age 11 till I was 16. Then I relocated back to the U.S. to the U.S. Olympic Training Center because the 88 Olympics were on the horizon. And I felt because I had played in Sweden professionally in the leagues over there that I really wanted to get back to the state. So I trained for the 88 team. I was very fortunate to make that. Stayed with it through 92. 
made that team. And then in 95 is when I really kind of pulled back. I was already finishing up my schooling, my college, and um, just really kind of jumped into coaching a lot more. And I would say without any hesitation, coaching is just as exciting for me as playing ever was. I mean, there's, there's so much you've just said there. I'm, I've got a million and one questions. Um, what are your thoughts on, on the chance of people making it to the top having not gone through that kind of intensive thing at a young age that you've had? Well, I I think the one strength that I had was, and it started at that Northern Virginia Table Tennis Club, when you've lost every match for a year and every game for a year, it makes you approach the game slightly different. And I think those experiences are all kind of what makes us unique as players. Um, I was listening to, um, I think, Table Tennis Daily did an interview with Waldner yesterday in this last week, and he talked about how many matches that he played and that he was never really afraid to play. He wanted to have fun. He wanted to make it a passionate part of his life. And I think when you play a lot, that makes it that much more exciting because then losses have less meaning. Um, I will say that a well-rounded athlete is the perfect student for me. I don't want to have the person who's only played table tennis. I I ask if they've played soccer. I've asked what other ball sports. Have they played a racket sport? Um, Just because that kind of muscle memory can be tapped into rather easily. Um, We've had in the U.S. a number of players. George Brathwaite comes to mind. I want to say he didn't pick up the racket till he was, I want to say, maybe even after the juniors, 18 or 19. He made our national team. He made our Pan Am Games team. Um, He's been one of the best senior players um, in the countries, in the Hall of Fame. I mean, he's played on our world championship team. So it is doable. I mean, there's no question. Of course, if you ever to see George, you'd be like, well, that's amazing. But he was a track and field star for Guyana. So, I mean, you look at his build and even at age 60 or 70, he could probably run me into the ground. So I think that the experiences can be drawn and make you a, a ultimately a stronger player. Um, but I, I never, when a student starts, um, look at their age as really something that's going to reduce their level of fun or stop them from reaching their potential. Do you think that, so I know the story of George is quite impressive, but that was, that was a long time ago now. Do you think that could happen now with like a, a you know, maybe a 15 year old who's never played before now kind of making it to, to a national team? I actually do think so, and I think because the equipment changes, I think now it's more athletic with the um, larger ball. Um, I just I just see us moving more towards tennis has been, where the the super fit, the super strong. If you, I mean, you look at the Chinese. I mean, they're just monsters right now. Um, they've always been, even in the 70s and 80s when I was playing. But if you just look at the legs on each of the players, I mean, th- those legs don't occur from just doing backhand to backhand, forehand to forehand. I mean, it's just tons and tons of multi-ball, tons of footwork drills. And I think that can be brought into the mix if a person's played in another sport. Um, I think the game is in some ways getting more simple than what it was um, when we had the hidden serves, the change of long pips and all the different racket equations. Um, So it wouldn't surprise me to see, I think didn't Grubid, he started when he was like, maybe 12 or 13. So, I mean, that was relatively late and he was a world cup champion. So I don't think 15 would be out of, out of mind to reach the national level or even do well internationally. Okay. And the, and the way you think the game is going, you think it's now more suited to kind of natural athlete type characters? Yeah. I mean, a a fuller developed athlete, um, I think is going to benefit versus somebody who's just so, or so set up. I mean, if I had to give you an example, I think more of an Alan Cook than a Carl Preen, right? Alan was always just ridiculously fit. I mean, even to this day, I mean, he took a break for a number of years, came back, did exceptionally well. He might have won the Commonwealth or got to the finals. Um, he was during my generation. Carl was just a great tactician, just a super student of the game, used the long tips exceptionally well and could battle anyone. I mean, I remember hearing and watching matches where he took off Waldner like under 10 to straight in cadets and junior titles in Europe. So I think we're going to see more um, Alan Cooks in the future just because the the sport lends itself to um, needing more muscle to um, sustain the rally and also to put the ball away. Okay. Um, I wonder if you could share 
kind of give us an idea of what was the the peak of your playing career maybe it's a it's a ranking or a tournament or a big win or, or something that really stands out in your mind where you kind of felt like that was that was the real pinnacle of what you achieved Okay, I'll, I guess everyone loves to talk about their best win as if it's the normal thing that occurs all the time. Um, but the story that I've shared with a lot of my students was I was in Sweden playing in a Grand Prix tournament in Gothenburg, um, which was a pretty big tournament. And I had a chance to play against Eric Lind. And going into the match, like every cocky American player, I thought I had a realistic chance. I mean, he this was, gosh, it must have been 85 um, so he'd already had his great world championships kind of out of the box in 83 um, in Tokyo. And um, I went down, we did the match, rolled the ball. And I want to say I got beat at four and six. I mean, these are games to 21. Okay. So it's not like the 11 right. pointers. So I literally couldn't put one of his serves on the table. And level wise, USA table tennis rating, I was already over um, probably 2,400. And I would later win the men's singles that December. Um, so I wasn't a hack. I wasn't a poor player, but it was during the hidden service um, generation. And as a lefty, I literally guessed wrong on every single serve. I mean, it probably got to the point where he thought, I thought this guy was good. And he beat me so bad. And I kind of waddled back to the bench with all the other Angby players. And no one was like even wanting to talk to me because they felt how bad I was feeling out there. And then we played in the U.S. Open um, three months later. And the difference in the, the time was I spent as much time as I could every day, maybe up to an hour a day, practicing my hidden serves. And it was just heavy underspin, no spin, a little bit of side top. But to lefties, they weren't going to see any contact. And um, I beat him two straight at the U.S. Open. And at the time, he was ranked 11th in the world. Um, it put me in the final four with Wu Wen Jia, who was the Taiwanese top player, Waldner, and I think Pearson. So... For me, it was more of seeing a problem, realizing I didn't like the outcome, doing everything within my power um, to correct the situation, and then going through and executing it. In that particular match, I also had a Swedish coach. His name, for those in Stockholm, is well known. His name is Nisa Sandberg. And he had seen Eric Lind play countless matches. So he knew exactly what to say to me, where to serve to, what to mix up. And at the same time, he had full confidence, even though he had seen me get beat so badly. Um, my other top wins, um, one U.S. Open while he was still, I, I want to say his last year in the juniors, I beat um, Jean-Philippe Gassien um, in a German Open. I beat Zoran Primorats when he was entering, leaving the juniors and be, going into the men's division. Um, Ding Yi was a player I beat at a World Championships. Um, I beat Andre Mazinoff in a French Open. Um, Trying to think who else. I lost a painful match to Skylet Andrew at a World Championships in the first round. Um, my wor highest world ranking was in the in the 90s. Um, I would say that for the most part, our biggest limitation in the U.S. is we'd only play one or two tournaments maximum a year internationally. So it was the U.S. Open and then maybe a Pan Am Games um, or World Championships. And I really feel that in order to compete with those players on a similar level, you have to play them regularly. I mean, you just can't play them once a year and expect to know what their tendencies are. Um, we had no videotape per se or no YouTube where you could say, okay, well, I know exactly what Jean-Michel Save is going to do or um, what the Chinese were going to do. I mean, you just, you just didn't see it. Today, it, the players have such a luxury of being able to see not only their matches, other people's matches, a lot of their tournaments are streamed live. So um, I, I would say... I was perfectly set up to be a very passionate coach where I was good enough as a player to have played against the top players in the world, um, but I wasn't a, a person who everyone was fearing. Um, it was like, oh, watch out for that American. He might fight to the last point. A little bit like Jean-Michel Save, I felt like I had to fight for every point. I wasn't going to wow them with touch or um, a particular shot, although my forehand was probably the best part of my game. So Something that you mentioned there was the idea of how you know when when you'd go and play these guys you really didn't know that much what kind of styles they had what their strengths and weaknesses were you weren't able to watch them on youtube and obviously that's something that people can do now how important do you think that is like do you, do you think that all the top players are kind of analyzing all their opponents are they 
are they kind of sitting down and doing that? Are they? Uh, do you think some of them don't really bother with that at all? Uh, I'd be interested to to hear your thoughts on on that side of the game, kind of scouting opponents. I think in table tennis, um, if you look at the best country in the world, is China. They've been doing it since the seventies. No questions asked. They've been they've been treating the sport as a professional sport, like in the U.S. we do with basketball, baseball, or football. I think it's relatively new for the rest of the world. Um, and it's just because we're more of a participatory way of thinking. Coaching has, is relatively new in table tennis. I want to say that the Chinese might have started it in like the mid to late 60s. In the past, there was no coaching. Um, obviously, there's no coaching in tennis, although you might have a, a trainer or somebody that works with you in between events. Um, so I was a little bit early to the technology where I started with the VHS tapes and I have most of my matches from the age of 12. So I knew all my opponents in the U S and it was part of my training ritual was to watch the, the tapes as we called it after tournaments. And it was painful because you could see how badly <laughs> you did things, but it just gave you a really good sense of the tendencies of your opponents. And my generation was the Danny C. Millers, the Eric Bogans, the Scott Butlers, um, Scott Bogans, Ricky C. Millers. So I actually have tons of tape on them. In Europe, when we would go, when I would play for Angby in Stockholm, there wasn't any videotaping. No one thought about that. You might see a, a highlight on the news, but no one really got into it. So I think now the sport is catching up. I think if you look at any ITTF Pro Tour event, every player has a little small, either a smartphone or some type of camera that's recording to an SD card. And we're moving in that direction. But I think table tennis is a little bit slow. And I think that as a coach, I try to get my students to embrace it as quickly as possible because there's nothing better than to see your, a mistake by yourself. That's the mm. quickest way to improve. And as I coach each of my students, whether they're eight years old or 70 years old, um, I videotape the lesson. I throw it onto YouTube. I send them the link, hopefully within 24 hours. And I ask them to watch the lesson before we do our next one. And it just saves so much time and energy. You don't feel like you're regurgitating the same information. Um, but to answer your direct question is, I, I think that we could do more, but it's going to really be on the sh on the shoulders of the coaches because the coaches have the time. Um, during the Athens Paralympics where I was coaching, we were actually videotaping opponents and then watching it pr prior to the next match so that we could actually formulate game plans, look at service tendencies, look at openings. Um, you don't want to overdo it. I mean, that's, I think, the one big challenge for all coaches is to try to do a complete brain dump. <laughs> you want to simplify it. You want to keep the athlete fresh and creative and thinking for themselves. Um, but if you can drive home one or two points, whether it's in between games or whether it's watching a video with them together or at the end of the day saying, hey, guys, our serves are going long and everyone says, well, no, they weren't. And I'm like, okay, well, let's go to the videotape and take a look. And all of a sudden they're like, oh my gosh, the guy opened up on six of my serves. I need to shorten it up a little bit. Um, so we are in, the technology is so inexpensive these days. I think you'll see more players at all levels. I mean, even down to beginner wanting to videotape themselves to kind of just speed up that learning curve. Yeah. And I mean, that's something that I've actually been pushing for a while now is just trying to encourage people to film themselves at tournaments I know, I know some sometimes people feel a little bit embarrassed they feel like you know people are going to think that they think they're a big shot because they've brought a video camera or something but you know as you say it's so valuable they can get so much information from watching it back just you know bring a phone and a tripod set it up and and film some of your matches it's it's basically a free lesson I mean, you play one match in a tournament, you're going to be able to pull probably three to four hours of valuable information on what you're doing, what you're not doing. And that's not even counting, beginning, beginning to kind of categorize and classify what your opponent's doing, which you'll probably face in the future. Um, when I was coaching um, one of my players, her name is Jackie Lee, before the Olympic tryouts for Beijing, on her Google Docs page, I had every one of her opponents playing her in a match and she could literally go on any time and just click and watch the last two or three performances of her um, competition two weeks, three weeks going into it. And that's such a um, insurance blanket where you could like, Oh my gosh, now I know what to expect. They're going to do this serve. They're going to play this return. Hey, let's try this. Or she would watch something and 
send me a note and say, hey, look at this point at like the three minute mark. Do you think that's a normal tendency or is that she was just uncomfortable? And then when you can discuss that, you just build a much broader plan, which I think reduces anxiety and nervousness when you know what to see or what to expect. Um, so I, I think it's just a great tool. And I mentioned to you earlier, I think I have over 4,000 videos of students on my YouTube channel um, that I share on a weekly basis. As I do a lesson, I videotape it and I put it up there. Yeah, fantastic. And and hopefully all the coaches listening will, will take that on board because that's going to be so valuable to all the players that are receiving kind of one-to-one coaching if they can watch it back and, yeah, just see exactly what they're doing. Okay, I I um I knew that you'd been coaching uh, the kind of the U.S. Paralympic team and, and a number of high-profile players. I didn't realize until we we started talking a little bit earlier that that kind of the majority of players that you coach now are kind of the the intermediate improver players, which which is exciting for me because most of my audience are in that intermediate category. Maybe they're trying to to break the kind of two thousand ranking or, or or kind of reach their own goals. I was wondering if you could just share some some tips that you or, or some things that you think are really important for kind of the intermediate players, players that have started playing tournaments or in leagues They're they're kind of, they've got the basics, but they're trying to take their game up to the next level. They're maybe playing kind of three or four times a week. So they take it quite seriously, but, but they're really keen to kind of improve and, and improve quite quickly. What, what are the things that you think are important? What should they be focusing on? What's maybe overrated and, and not as important as they think? I wonder if you could just just share some some advice with them. No, absolutely. So the number one thing that – and I, I love getting new students. I've had like three new students in the last two weeks. And that first lesson when they have no idea where you're going to take them. Um, my job is to give them a roadmap that makes sense, that's easy to follow. But it's it, it, you don't want to supply them with a, a fire hose of information and just blow them away the first day because, as you know, the sport isn't learned in one day. Um, you want to give them bite-sized information that keeps them hungry but allows them to progress at the rate that they're comfortable with. Um, the one aspect that connects everything for me is footwork. Um, if a person decides that they're going to play the sport without having any footwork – it makes it almost impossible for me to teach strokes because you literally have to have 15 different backhands, 16 different forehands. Because if you're not moving your feet to set up that one fluid stroke, your elbow is going to be moving all over the place. Your shoulders are probably square to the table. And you're just basically turning it into a blocking game. You're just going to block on the backhand, block on the forehand. And once I let them know that they're going to get into shape, I actually have them through the – advice and support of Brian Pace, all my students wear a wrist heart monitor. So I'm tracking during the lesson their heart rate the entire time. And it's amazing when you can show somebody that their rating has not only improved, but their level of fitness and their heart rate has improved where it's like, oh, when you used to do this footwork drill, you were at 160 beats per minute for seven minutes. Now you're down to 120. That's improvement right there. I don't care what you say. I don't care who you beat. You are a better athlete today. And that's something tangible. I mean, they can see the numbers. So footwork is what it's all about. I generally, for even the beginners, have them doing both static and random footwork drills, where it might be for a static, um, something like a Falkenberg or even um, one wide to the backhand, one wide to the forehand. So they have to pick up both of their feet twice. Okay, I don't want to just have them take one lunge with the right foot and one, one lunge with the left. I want them to actually move and learn how to judge the distance between themselves and the ball so that they can turn their shoulders on their forehand and swing through the ball. Um, the second thing I would say is that I try to teach them to hit the ball with their body and not their arm. Try to get all the muscle groups working equally versus just powering through it with your bicep and maybe your forearm. Um, a lot of people that come into the sport, they think that table tennis is either wrist or arm, and they're mm. very surprised when I have them doing footwork drills that require them to really turn their shoulders almost perpendicular to hit a ball down the line. The other element I really focus on with new players and players of all levels is the concept of targeting. My philosophy is all good players – can hit the ball to any spot on the table from any spot on the table. Now, you will see some players that are just outstanding in certain patterns, 
I mean, you even have the very best in Europe that are known for if you let them open up with their forehand from their backhand corner, they're going to play it so wide out to your forehand, you're going to knock yourself out of the point. But if you look at the Chinese way of coaching and training, um, let's say Ma Long, he's just as likely to loop the ball down the line as he is wide cross court. And that's because his setup and his footwork and his, his stroke mechanics are so solid. So when I'm doing multi-ball drills with my students, I'll put coasters. Um, those are just like little you know, circular things that you'd have to find at a pub. Put coasters yeah. on the table, and they have to aim at those coasters. And it's never like, well, just hit every ball to this one. I have them in different locations based on their footwork. So I make it so it forces them to have a fuller stroke because if you can't play your forehand down the line – you're going to be telegraphing that you're going cross court. So I focus on footwork, I focus on targeting, and I focus on making sure that they're using their entire body versus just a subset of muscles. Because ultimately, you have to be able to extend the rally, you have to stay balanced, and you have to expect the ball to come back. If at any time you don't do one of those three, you're probably going to be losing to your peers. And my job is to help them not beat the players they're better than, but the ones right at their level and just slightly above. Um, and I, I'll do, I'll use robots. I love robots. Um, I'll use, um, multi-ball quite a bit. Almost every lesson I'll be a chopper, get the opponent to loop against me. Cause as I was growing up, we had a lot of defensive players at my club. And I think that taught me not only the ability to use my legs effectively, but it taught me patience and patience is the one skill that I think is the most overlooked or the one that I have to return to when I'm coaching players in matches and just in training is that we all tend to get too excited that we're going to hit the ball and we don't think about how we're going to hit it or where we're going to hit it. Um, and I always talk about hands being more active than your feet. You want your feet to make the first movement, not your hands. So th that's kind of like my philosophy in a nutshell. Um, people realize if you're going to get lessons from Sean that you're probably going to sweat through a shirt because he's not going to just like hit it to your paddle. He's going to make you move quite a bit. And then in tournaments, um, I love doing the tactical side of it, explaining why something is a smart move and why it's not a smart move. Um, that to me is the most exciting part of the sport is when we get to the tournament phase and we start thinking about how do we play chess instead of playing checkers. Yeah. Brilliant. Fantastic. So much stuff there. The, the one, the one thing I want to ask is, is about the footwork. Now I know that you were saying about doing kind of different drills to try and get the feet moving. I know that with some players and especially with, with older players, you can give them drills and they'll find ways to, to do it without moving their feet or without moving their feet correctly. Um, do you do you ever do things for footwork kind of away from the table? What what do you do if you're if you if you're the kind of player that knows that your footwork is bad and it's holding you back, but you just struggle when you're trying to you know do rallies and and play with the ball to actually focus on getting the feet right? Have you got any tips for people kind of how to really get that moving? Um, I I, th I think one of the lucky elements that I have as coming from a strong player before is I can place the ball really well. So when I'm doing footwork drills, I'm constantly monitoring their balance points and their weak spots, and I will just hammer people. It doesn't mean I'm smashing, but I will make them move. I mean, I, I can put the ball on the white line on both sides pretty consistently, no matter where they place it on the table. And my goal is if you can't get past the fourth or fifth ball, um, it's you're just going to get smoked. And here's one example um, of a concrete drill that I'm doing. I have my players, and you talked about this with Sam, about him learning an opening loop. Right now, I've got five players who are all probably in this 15 to 1600 range, and we've been working on opening loops. So we play a game. It's called plus or minus. If I get a point, it goes minus. If they get a point, it goes plus. I win when I go to minus 10. They win when they go to plus four. And the drill is set up where they serve, and I can push it anywhere. And if they do an opening loop successfully, I can't win that point. I can only lose it. So they're fighting to make that first opening loop, and I'm pushing it wide forehand. I'm pushing it into their elbow, pushing it to their backhand. They either have to backhand loop or forehand loop it. And then if we get into the rally, if they miss the loop, I get the point. If they make the loop, we keep fighting for the rally, and if they win the point, they can score. So it's one more kind of fun way that you can make it competitive, but it's my position that I'm trying to focus my positional play, which is going to force them to move their feet off the table. It's really tough. I mean, you can go running, you can do sprints, you can do cycling. And that's what I did as a player. But 
I mean, maybe throwing the robot into random mode and saying, how many forehands can you do in a row when it's shooting from the far left to the far right randomly anywhere so that you have to hit, move, and get ready? That might be a, a little thing that you can test um, or play games where you only use your forehand and the person can only block softly, but you have to play all forehands. But it really is, in my mind, the difference between the sport and the game. The people who can move their feet and play really take the whole game to a whole nother level. It's the ones that are just kind of camping in the center and looking to make bat on ball contact. Um, they're really missing out. And um, it's tough on the legs. I mean, your quads are going to be burning if you have a good workout. You know it as a runner and as a coach. It's like if you're going to go and do it right, you're going to feel it afterwards. So I just let players know early on that you're going to have to move your feet. You're going to have to. I mean, I can't coach a stroke if I can't have you sit up properly yeah and i think that's so important when you know you see people going into a match maybe they've done loads of regular drills or just forehand backhand and you know they've got really good at hitting a nice backhand loop when the ball is on their left hip and then when they go into a match and it's you know a little bit wider or, or kind of coming into their onto their right hip of course they can't play a good backhand loop if they're not moving their feet because that's a completely different shot isn't it like the arm is just the mechanics of it is going to be completely different unless you're able to get your body position into the it's, into the place where you want it. Yeah, it's certainly a lot easier to move your feet correctly than to create a new stroke. And what are, yeah. what are the best players doing? They're hitting to your elbow, they're hitting wide angles, they're waiting for you to move, and they're hitting behind you. So if you want to do well in tournaments, you have to do a lot of irregular play. You have to play against all different rubber surfaces, righties, lefties. I mean, tournament play is so different than practice. Um, one example of one of my close friends, he said it's – like you've just done artwork and then somebody's going to come up and spl splash some paint on it. They're trying to screw you up. They're trying to mess you up. They don't want to let you play that perfect shot. And I'm aware as a coach that my ball is so much cleaner than what most of my players are going to see in any level of matches. So I have a long pips paddle. I do stuff where it's like I'll play my backhand in the center of the table just to let them see what we call it a chicken wing, what that's going to look like in a match because – most of their players aren't going to naturally move off of contact. The one thing I forgot to mention is I often stress, or I always stress, don't start your movement when the ball crosses the net. Start your movement as the ball's leaving your opponent's paddle. And maybe a little bit early, um, the new app that came out from our friends down on, under um, William Hensel and the uh, they just updated, I want to say in the last 24 hours, where now they have serves on it. Um, oh, really? The TT Edge? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, the, if, the kind of brain brain training. Yeah, yeah. If, if I wanted yeah, to yeah, yeah. use the word brilliant, um, I definitely feel like what they did just took it to a whole new level along with what I think Brian Pace did with his um, aerobic um, kind of table tennis workout. Um, I've, I make all my students do the table tennis app. I mean, I forced everyone to buy it the first day it was out. And I said, you know what? This is what you need to be doing. And um, the kids love it, the, the young students. I mean, they're all good at it. And they're sending me screenshots. Look at I hit, got 10 out of 10. I'm like, well, you've got to move up to the next intermediate level. So watching the rat ball come off the blade and the paddle, that's when we start to process the information, not when it crosses the net. Um, far yeah. too many adults, the reason they don't move, it's too late. They haven't even picked up on whether it was a ball going to their backhand or to their forehand or to their elbow. So, um, yeah, that's something I, I made a note knowing that we were going to chat that I wanted to make sure I didn't forget because th that's so critical. And when players have tr trouble with timing, the first question I ask them is, where are you picking up the ball? And most of the time they'll be like, I'm not even aware. And I'm like, well, you're probably not picking it up off my racket then. Yeah. And um, do, you, do you see that the adults maybe learn that slower than children? Do you see a difference there in how quickly – adults and, and children are able to kind of pick up on those anticipatory cues because so, you know some people say that once you get past a certain age it becomes much more difficult to learn and that's why adults often look kind of clunky when you watch them play with they haven't played as kids you know i, I think it, it could be a case by case i don't know if like the myelin in our brains becomes a little stiffer as we get older um i have found that i've had adults make tremendous progress when I stick to the basics and really hammer home, moving their feet for every shot, um, picking up the ball early, thinking about where they're hitting the ball, not just when I say, you know, where did you play that last ball? And they said, on the table. And I'm like, that's just not good enough. You've got four and a half by five feet of distance. You can place a number of balls in there. 
you've got to think of what I'm doing on my side of the net. If you're unaware of what I'm doing on my side of the net, you're not even playing half the game. So mm. I, I think it's up to the coaches. Um, the kids improve at such a fast rate. There's no question about that. Um, they're building that muscle memory really quickly. And a lot of times, because they don't have the pure muscles, they have to use proper mechanics because they need to use momentum a little bit in order to generate the power. They have to use their weight transfer. They have to use their shoulder turns. Um, they have to use their wrist and forearm together in order to make the ball go somewhere because they don't have the weight behind it. Adults tend to have all the issues of maybe 30 years of playing sports, all different sports where they didn't have, if they played tennis, maybe they didn't move their feet. So that, that falls into their table tennis or they might've played soccer and they're really fast. So they overrun shots. I often, often find that people overrun the forehand when you tell them to move their feet, they're like, oh, oh I'm going to move to my forehand. And they're not even picking up to stop early to give themselves enough space to turn through the ball. Um, that That's like one of my top five things of a checklist of when people are missing shots. It's like, I hit it wide to your forehand. You ran past the stopping point, And now you're wondering why you're playing a backhand on your forehand side on the following shot. Because you literally just ran past the ball. I mean, we're not tennis. We're table tennis. Take a step and a half, you're there. Versus three steps, and then now you can't cover the wide backhand. So it, it's just so much fun. I mean, it's it's so enjoyable. And then to he, have the students explain to you what you've been telling them for the last six weeks because it finally sunk in, um, that's really gratifying. The the last thing I wanted to touch on is um, I know that you've, you've been kind of coaching a few guys. You, you said it's almost kind of like, they're they're doing their own kind of expert in a year thing like they they started at a similar time and you've seen them progressing they watch the video they're kind of comparing themselves i wonder if you could kind of let us know how that's going and and how that's been well first off i just wanted to say thank you for having the idea of doing it and then actually executing it i mean sam basically did all the work but i mean you had to be his kind of tour guide to um give him the confidence and also to challenge him so as you started it, I had two or three players um, coming from the world of tennis, and we were watching it on a regular basis. And every time I'd be like, well, Sam could make that shot. Or, you know, how is this going to look if the Brits are beating the Americans in this expert in a year deal? And mm-hmm. my thought was, I'm being judged as a coach compared to Ben, because if my guy can't do everything that Ben can do, well, maybe everyone should just call up Ben and join your website and get tips. Or I know my friends down in Ping Skills, they do such an outstanding job that I have. I encourage my students to get information from everywhere and anywhere. So right now, my students haven't played that many tournaments. They play league matches, and I have them pair up against other students of mine. If I have a six o'clock lesson till seven, I'll put another lesson at seven and I'll have the two players play matches against each other. And then I'll start it a little bit later. So they get some match play. Um, but we've really been focusing on the footwork, the opening shots, cont- a quality backhand block looping to multiple locations, whether it's down the line with their forehand or to the pocket or to the wide forehand. And just this last week, my one student who I would say is most on the comparison track, um, is great pendulum serve. I would say it's almost as strong as mine, and he did it all on his own. The first serves were about a mile high over the net, long, and he would serve and pick up the ball because I would just finish the point. I'd be like, that serve isn't going to work against anyone. And um, now he's gotten to the point where it's really short, tight. He can mix up with side top, side chop. He's going to do inside out next. Um, Level-wise, I would say he can compete with anyone, gosh, I would say around... I would say 16 to 1700. However, elements of his game are clearly at the 2000 level. It's just the weakest parts of his game because he doesn't have that experience um, are around 1600, maybe even 1400. So the one thing that your lesson taught me was no one's ever going to move up in just a linear fashion. There's going to be parts of their game that are very advanced. And they, I, I, I'll tell um, my student, right? I'll say like, boy, that last drill that you did was at the 2000 level and he'll think mm. well i'm a 2000 player i'm like yeah but your serve return still at 1300 so we've got to kind of mix and match and focus and it gives us a lot to work on so that it's not just well now i got a 2000 level loop but my serve return stinks so you need to have those little stepping stones but the game is so um, broad that there's always something new to work on but also having my student loop against chop 
and I'll, I got long pips and I'll chop. And if he can loop five or six in a row, then it's like a high five. That's like, because he's looping his own spin, he's reading it, he's moving his feet, he's judging. That's not an easy thing, even for a 17 or 1800 player to loop five balls in a row with good spin against long pips. Um, mm. cause it, again, it's, it's footwork based, but because we have kind of made it the extend the rally, no unforced errors, try not to knock yourself out. Um, it seems to be working. Um, at some point I would love if you ever have, if, if Sam's ever coming to the Northwest, if he's ever in Portland, you've got to let me know because I can set him up with about five or 10 players that would love to get a chance to play him and meet him. Um, but I, I just thought it was such a fun task that it seemed like the, um, internet, um, world just really kind of got behind and the number, the amount of traffic that you got, um, the positive, thing from a coach that I could say, look at, you're not the only one out there trying to go against odds or trying to improve or to have some self goals. Um, look at Sam, he's trying to do this and he's having it being filmed. It was kind of like reality sports, right? Um, where every practice session, he realizes that it's, it's counting. So I, I just, I just thought it was the, one of the coolest things, um, that has hit the internet in table tennis for quite some time. Yeah. And what really came out of it for, for both of us was how tough it really is like just to keep going when there's so much to learn isn't there and there's so many things that that I know just during the year Sam kind of felt like he was completely useless at and wasn't getting it but just if he was able to keep going day after day for for all kind of all the months and, and the year then eventually it does start to click together but it can just feel like you're kind of plowing through thick mud at, at points and not really getting anywhere. Yeah, and I, and I think it's the, those eureka moments where the game almost seems like it's ready to fall apart right before you kind of fit the puzzle together. I know with my student, Ryan, we've had three of these moments in the last, I would say, eight weeks where I thought he was going to quit. I was just like, you know what? This isn't fun for him. I don't mind it. I mean, I, I know what it's like, but I could just see the frustration and then boom, something clicked. And the backhand started making sense. Oh, then we started looping 15 forehands in a row. Oh, the serves went from nothing to, I, I told him in our last lesson, I was like, you know what? Please don't change your serve for the next like year. You're serving at such a high level. If you think that you need to add new things to it, you're just shooting yourself in the foot. And it's always, I guess, right be, um, before the, the rain or the storm, things look bleak. And then all of a sudden it clears and you just see simplicity. Things start to make sense that, hill that you're pushing against doesn't seem so high and um, i think as a coach you just have to have that patience know that you're going in the right direction know that um the toughest losses can be the most valuable know that um easy wins really don't help all that much um i mean it looks good on paper if you can add an extra title but it's really those little losses that can really create the character um that builds the player so um yeah i think more and more adults are finding that our sport is so fun, that it's so dynamic, it's so complex, that it always gives you a new look every day that you go and play it. There's never going to be – and here's one final thing I'll also mention is people ask me, am I getting worse? And it doesn't make sense to me how you can play or do any sport and have more experience and then be worse because of it. You might not execute at your top at some point in a tournament or a competition, but you're not actually getting worse. Um, maybe if you broke your leg and you couldn't move, that might classify it. Or if you don't train for six weeks, maybe you could say I'm not as sharp, but every time you go out and you play a match, you do a practice session, you do a drill, you're gaining experience. And it's, mm. it's these experiences that make Jan Ove Waldner one of the greatest of all time. It, it makes the players before him, um, that he looked up to the Stellan Banksons, the, um, Shell Yuan Sons. It's those experiences that we build and grow on. And I, I think getting associated not only with a good coach, but a passionate coach is going to help anyone when they run into those little pitfalls where you always, everyone has them. I mean, no, no one goes straight to the top. You always have those setbacks. You just hope that if you take one step backwards, you can do those two steps forward. Um, so I just would try to be as encouraging and let people know that um, – those those were those bad losses actually are the things that um champions ended end up being made of yeah well i think i think that's a brilliant place to leave it just uh on that kind of message that everything that you do is just kind of 
building you up, whether it's a, it's a match that you win or lose, whether it's a, a training session, a drill, everything is kind of getting stacked up and is kind of going into the bank somewhere and, and it was going to help me further, further down the line. And it's just, yeah, I mean, it's in some sports, progress is, is, is linear or, or at least relatively linear. I mean, I've been doing running at the moment and, you know, pretty much if I do a good month of training, then I can run my 5K or my 10K 30 seconds faster than I could the month before. And, and if I do another good month, it, it kind of continues. Whereas table tennis, it can seem like, you know, you just do a few months and the results just aren't happening and, you know, it's not coming together. And then, like, I've had other guests on the podcast who just say there's just one tournament and then all of a sudden like they get these massive results and they shoot up in their in their ranking or their rating and then from then on that's it they're at this completely new level and it's just kind of like big steps up instead of a kind of gradual climb up and and I think that's that's where people can kind of get lost along the way is if they if they don't understand that that's how it works. When, and I, I think to your point, um, as a coach, what I try to do is at ev- every tournament or even after a training session is what are you going to point out? What are you going to focus on? And you can play in a tournament and have a miserable tournament, but I could say, you know what, your serves were outstanding. Your footwork was super. You To have all of them come together, to have that big leap takes a lot of work and a lot of energy. But I think as a coach, I mean, you can be in great physical shape and just have a mental breakdown at nine all because you were afraid of losing or because somebody was watching. So, I mean, as a coach, I'm always giving players making them do a self grading. And then I give them a grade, but I spread it out because we've got the mental, the mental side, we've got the footwork side, we've got strokes, we've got tactics. And then the extra one that I throw in there is just your hustle. I mean, are you fighting for every ball? Does a ball touch the ground? If it hits the net without your paddle going towards it, um, that is something that can help so that it doesn't seem so black and white. It's very easy to look at the scoreboard at the end of the tournament and determine whether it was a success or failure based on who who won the match. But you have no control over your opponents, how hard they've been training. I mean, that's completely outside of your control. But what you can do is you can look and see what areas you're focused on and where the improvement is. And you don't have to improve in every area, but you should be focusing on some specific aspects. And a lot of times it's just, it's a player you haven't seen. It's a tournament you haven't played in. Um, it's It's a new environment. And going to a an Olympic trials the second time is that much easier than the first time. A world championships is much easier. So um, I try not to be too tough on the players that it's a do or die, um, but I just let them know that, hey, you're building that pool or reservoir of experience that you'll be able to draw upon. And um, I do want them to focus hard in practice. I do want the intensity at tournament level when we're doing a drill. I don't want them swatting at balls or letting balls go to the floor without an effort. Um, but clearly that road for everyone, um, is going to be slightly different and it, and it needs to be because we all come from different, um, starting points and we all probably have different end, end lines ultimately. Totally. Well, th- this has been brilliant, Sean. Thank you so much for, for joining us on the show. I know that, you know, that everyone listening is going to have got so much great stuff from, from you and, and from this interview. How can people get in touch with you if that's something that they that they'd be interested in doing? If you've got kind of a, a website or or social media stuff, um, I would say the easiest way. Um, I'm the webmaster for USA Table Tennis, so I would definitely encourage everyone to come to usatt.org. I try to put up at least twenty to thirty new new articles every week on the USA Table Tennis website. Um, We also have a Facebook account. Um, If a person needed to reach me, they could go through the USA Table Tennis Facebook. We have a Twitter account as well as Google+. Um, If somebody was going to be coming to the Portland area, um, they can search the Portland Table Tennis Club, and I've got my coaching contact information there. And I probably have at least 10 or 15 players a year that happen to be coming through um, Oregon, and they find my name and number that way. And then we hook up for a a lunchtime lesson, or maybe it's just a hit around in the evening. Um, But hopefully this new club through Paddle Palace um, will get going soon. And then that'll be a real easy spot to find me um, once it's opened seven days a week. Um, But you can reach me through Facebook. It's my Facebook page is just um, Sean O'Neill and you can send me a friend request. Great. Brilliant. And if they contact USA Table Tennis, you're the guy kind of behind that community. Yeah, and, and, yeah, and that's, yeah, that's just my, my first name at usatabletennis.org. You can reach me there. 
Brilliant. Cheers, John. That, that's, that's been awesome. Thank you so much. Keep up the great work. Cheers. Have a good day. What a fascinating interview. A uh, big thanks to Sean for joining me on the show. What an amazing story he's got. Experiencing such intense table tennis at such a young age. Um, obviously, he was just so passionate about it. And that's, you know, that's, that's really shown in the fact that he was able to achieve so much success as a player and then still have so much motivation to keep going as a coach. So many great tips Sean shared there. Oh, too many to mention. I, I love the fact that he talks about really focusing on the footwork, making sure that you get your footwork right. Because as he said, I wrote down this quote, it's certainly a lot easier to move your feet correctly than to create a new stroke. And that's just so true. It's, it's so much easier just to learn to get yourself in the right position so that you can play your one good backhand that you've practiced instead of just stubbornly standing in one place and then having to play a million different backhands to all the different variations of balls that you that you might receive to different positions on the table. Get your feet right and you'll just find that the shots play itself. That's something that I've found both as a player and a coach. And, you know, whether you're 10 years old or 50, 60 years old, you're not too old to sort out your footwork. Don't think that you need to just learn to play a game where you just stand close to the table, reaching, prodding at the ball. Footwork is really key. And, you know, this it's not tennis. You haven't got to be darting from one side of the court to the other. It's just, like Sean said, that one step to the right, that one step to the left, that little adjustment that gets you in the right place to allow you to play your shots. So I really hope you enjoyed that interview. Probably one where you might even want to just rewind it, listen to it again, maybe make some notes, jot down some of the things that Sean was sharing. If you'd like to check out the show notes for this episode, you can head on over to experttabletennis.com forward slash episode 33. There will be some links on there to some of the things that came up in the interview. I'll be back in a month's time. This is the episode for April. I'll be releasing the next episode on the 1st of May. I hope you enjoyed the show. Again, head to experttabletennis.com to have a look at some of the other podcast episodes, read some of my blog posts and just get an idea of some of the things that I'm getting up to at the moment. I hope you enjoyed listening and good luck with your table tennis over the next month. I'll see you soon.